5, we read that Paul commended Timothy's sincere faith, a faith that was instilled by his grandmother and mother. And as I said last week, this is the second time in this letter that Timothy's God-fearing family are used to stir him up in his own progress in the faith. And I'm quite sure that this is going to stir us as well. That is, if our hearts are open to it. And hopefully they are. So let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your presence today, Lord. Thank you, God, for the gift of music. Thank you, Lord, that we can communicate the love that we have for you through the music that we sing, the songs that we play. It's a glorious thing, Lord, to give thanks to you. We give thanks to you, Lord, because you are good and your mercy endures forever. Heavenly Father, we would also like to pray for our time together in the word. Lord, I want to ask that you would speak to our hearts today. I know you have, I know that there's some material that we're going to be covering that I I think is going to get our attention today. In fact, I know it is. And so, Lord, we want to hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. You're speaking to your body today. And Lord, you're going to use your word to do it. Let me get out of the way and just allow you to speak. Father in heaven, we would also just like to pray for our brother Paul Smith. I know, Lord, that he's been uh, just discouraged by the uh, up and down situation that he's been in regarding infection and his blood, and we just pray for him, Father. We pray, first of all, for his heart and mind. Lord, that you would steal him, that you would strengthen him, God. And Lord, give him a mind that is just so enraptured in you, Lord, that nothing can shake him at the core of his being. And Lord, we also pray, God, would you please heal him? Would you please, Lord, take this infection out of his blood? And it looks as though, Lord, the doctors um, just aren't, aren't able to do what you can do, Lord. And Lord, we thank you for the doctors that have tended to him, but Lord, we know that ultimately you are the great healer. And so, Lord, we just lift him up to you. Lord, bless our time right now, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Verse 5. We're going to start at verse 5. For I am mindful of the sincere faith within you, which first dwelt in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and I am sure that it is in you as well. For this reason, I remind you to kindle afresh the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God has not given us a spirit of timidity, but of power and love and discipline or a sound mind. Now, let's stop there. Now, verse seven is definitely one of the most well-known and quoted verses in 2 Timothy. There's no doubt about that. But let's seek to understand it in its context so that we can make better application of it in our lives. Let's go back to verse six. This is where it really begins. Paul begins verse six with the phrase, for this reason. This is a very strong, causal opening statement. And obviously you can tell, it it connects verse six with what was previously said. Paul understands that Timothy's faith is genuine, that he is the real deal. He's not a false convert. He was a man who was raised up and nurtured in the faith by his mother and grandmother. And so he says here, for this reason, and then the words, I remind you. Someone who is sincere in their faith can be addressed in this forthright manner without without taking offense at the intrusion. Only an authentic faith will endure this kind of fatherly reminder. An inauthentic faith faith will just shrug it off. 
uh, you know, I know, I know, you, you said this before. I mean, I get it. Okay, okay, I know. I know I'm supposed to do that, that kind of a thing. You know when someone who needs to be stirred up or who needs to be reminded reacts that way? That that's not a good sign that they're really open to what you're gonna remind them of, right? Maybe they just think that you're being a bother. Well, this reminder was a reiter reiteration of something that Timothy already knew. I mean, that's what a reminder is, right? Something that he already knew. So he says here, I remind you, and then we read these words in the next part of verse six, to kindle afresh the gift of God which is in you. <clears throat> to kindle afresh the gift of God which is in you. Now that phrase, kindle afresh, comes from a single Greek word, and it means, as you can probably guess, it means to fan the flame. It means to excite into fresh activity. The word occurs only here in the New Testament. In the ancient world, a fire was in need of regular stoking. Those of you that are used to making fires know that you, if you don't keep stoking it and adding wood, you're just, it's just gonna burn down. Paul's encouragement to Timothy should not be read as a sign that his faith was slipping, but as a call to the attention that we all must give to our spiritual state. The appeal here is actually preventative rather than corrective. The appeal is timely and it's pertinent, pertinent in view of the development of hostility to Christianity, which we'll talk about later on. But the spiritual endowment that every believer receives is clearly to be understood as something that's dynamic and not static. In other words, it's something that needs to continuously be moved. It's not something that can exist in a still state. Something has to be done about it. It is purely a gift. But as a, it is a gift that we have to, that we must respond to and a relationship which we have to cultivate. This is actually a healthy reminder that even those in spiritual leadership, as Timothy was, are not exempt from the waning of spiritual health and intensity that comes from inattention and distraction. Believe, leaders have to make sure they're living in a constant state of being stirred up. If anything, those in spiritual leadership are to be more zealous and careful because the state of their spiritual health doubly affects those that they lead. The object here of such intense, constant personal attention is this gift from God. Now we're not told what this gift is. Some take it to mean the Holy Spirit while others understand it to mean a special ability that was conferred by the Lord for some form of Christian service. For instance, the, the gift of evangelist or pastor or teacher. I believe the latter to be the case. It seems clear that Timothy has been called into Christian service and had been given some special enablement. And here he is encouraged to kindle the gift into a living flame. He should not become discouraged by the general failure, failure around him. Neither should he become professional in his service for the Lord and lapse into a uh, comfortable, possibly lazy routine. Rather, he should be concerned to use his gift more and more as the days grow darker and darker. Notice it says here, he's to stir up the gift of God which is in him. Last part of the verse, through the laying on of my hands. Now the laying on of hands is the normative pattern for ordaining someone or sending someone out from ministry. You may recall in Acts 13, 
<clears throat> it says in Acts 13, 1, that there were at Antioch in the church that was there prophets and teachers. There was Barnabas, Simeon, Lucius, and Manian, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and of course Saul was there, Saul, a.k.a. Paul. And while they were ministering to the Lord, <coughs> excuse me, and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, separate me for me, Paul and Barnabas, for the work which I have called them. Then when they had fasted and prayed, they laid their hands on them and sent them away. Remember when the individuals in Acts chapter 6, when the apostles recognized that there was a need in the church, they said, you know, gather up men who are full of wisdom and, and they brought the men before the apostles and after praying, they laid their hands on them for, to commission them to, for that particular work. 1 Timothy 5.22, we covered that already, says do not lay hands upon someone too hastily. Excuse me. <coughs> and thereby share responsibility for the sins of others. So the laying out of hands, and we get that. Now we are given a more comprehensive understanding of what this part of the verse means when we couple it together with the parallel passage in 1 Timothy 4, which we've covered already, which says, do not neglect the spiritual gift within you, which was bestowed on you through prophetic utterance <coughs> with the laying on of hands by the presbytery. Similar, it's also similar there in 1 Timothy 4, <coughs> the exhortation that comes after that, which says, take pains with these things, be absorbed in them so that your progress will be evident to all. Pay close attention to yourself and to your teaching. Persevere in these things, for as you do this, you will ensure salvation both for yourself and for those who hear you. So, <clears throat> we, we get this. Paul's saying this that was given to you as we prayed over you. So it's not just that Paul, it's not just that Paul came alongside Timothy for this purpose, but there was a group of elders as well. The presbytery, as it says in 1 Timothy 4. So when Timothy put his faith in Christ, initially, the Holy Spirit indwelt him, as the Holy Spirit does all believers. But as the Holy Spirit began to shape Timothy's life, it became clear that he was, the Holy Spirit was calling him into ministry. And as the larger body of God's people recognized this calling, it was affirmed through the laying on of their leader's hands. And as they did so, the Holy Spirit revealed through that body the way <clears throat> that he would work, the Holy Spirit would work through Timothy in ministry. And that's generally how it happens, isn't it? Now, I want to say more about stirring ourselves up, but I want us to take a look at verse 7 first, and then we'll kind of put it all together. Look at verse 7 again. Once again, it begins with the connecting word, for, for God has not given us a spirit of timidity, but of power and love and discipline. So here, because of this connecting word, we're able to see that what it is Paul is cautioning Timi Timothy about. He's cautioning Timothy about this idea, this spirit of timidity. Now that's an interesting word there. Timidity is a word that speaks volumes in what it conveys about the person. <clears throat> it's defined here, it means fearfulness, cowardice, a shameful state of fear from a lack of courage. Now not all fear is bad. The scriptures tell us to fear the Lord, right? That's a good fear. We want to do that. It's also good to have a healthy fear of not wanting to jump into the lion enclosure at the zoo. It's, it's not a bad idea to be afraid of something like that, right? You ever see the people that do that? It's like, okay, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> Go for it, dude. <clears throat> Certain kinds of fear can be healthy when it keeps us from doing something dangerous. But the Bible also speaks of 
types of fear that paralyze us. For example, Proverbs 29, 25 says, the fear of man brings a snare, but he who trusts in the Lord will be exalted. So there's the fear of man. That's not a good fear to have. The kind of fear that this speaks of, timidity, is of the absolute worst kind. This is a fear that is debilitating. It's a fear that keeps the heart from trusting God. And it says here that God has not given us this kind of fear. The New Testament has some very sobering things to say about this kind of fear. The word for timidity here is actually from the same family of words that we find in this verse right here. <clears throat> Revelation 21.8. This might surprise you. But for the cowardly and unbelieving and abominable and murderers and immoral persons and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars, their part will be in the lake of fire, the, that, the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. The first word in that list is related to the word that we're looking at right here. It's the word cowardly. Jesus described such people in the parable of the soils. Jesus spoke about that one seed that was sown on rocky places. Remember that seed? Remember reading about that? <clears throat> this is the man who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy, but he has no firm root in himself, but is only temporary, and when affliction or persecution arises because of the word, immediately he falls away. Unfortunately, we've met quite a few people that have circled through the revolving door of this church at times. We've seen that happen, haven't we? People that shoot right out of the cannon like they're just gonna, like it's a cannonball that's gonna travel forever and then it just falls short of the mark. They don't keep walking with God. And Jesus said one of the reasons for that is the, the root is only temporary. Affliction persecutes arises because of the word and immediately they fall away. These are the types of people that Hebrew 10.39 speaks of shrinking back to destruction. In John 8, 31, Jesus defined those whose faith is genuine as those who continue in the word. Jesus was saying to the Jews who had believed him, if you continue in my word, then you are my, truly my disciples, Jesus said. <clears throat> now those who are truly his, his disciples it would be the opposite of the ones that Jesus spoke of in Matthew 10 when he said, therefore everyone who confesses me before men, I will also confess him before my Father who is in heaven, but whoever denies me before men, I will also deny him before my Father who is in heaven. So we gotta understand that this kind of timidity, this is not something that can live or should live within the Christian heart. Jesus really worked with his disciples on this issue of being cowardly. In fact, that one instant walking on the water, remember that? The disciples were ter terrified and Jesus said to them, why are you af afraid? How is it that you have no faith? He actually upbraided them for their unbelief. Now, connected to the word here, to connected to the definition that, that I gave you earlier of the word timidity here. <clears throat> this word also conveys the idea of the abandonment of responsibilities due to fear. Now, does this mean that Timothy was, was a naturally fearful individual? Well, he probably had an inclination toward that. But I do think that his reputation as such was, has probably been overstated. This word speaks to more than just timidity. It actually speaks to the terrorizing fear that causes one to turn tail and run when faced with a battle. That's what we're talking about here. Retreat! Take off. Now, as we've discussed in times past, Ephesus was home to many enemies of the gospel. We know that Paul had nearly lost his life there. False teachers, pagan unbelievers, and even disgruntled Christians all served to make Timothy's pastoral ministries, pastoral ministry a beachhead 
against the works of the evil one. Paul was not accusing Timothy of such cowardice, but was fortifying him against its very real possibility. The fearful impulse to quit is never from God. This is not at all the Spirit's way of working in the believer. In fact, even when a believer is chastened by God, God never puts it into their hearts to draw back and retreat, ever. Hebrews 12, you guys know that verse, or that series of verses in Hebrews 12. You wanna look at this real quick? Let's look at it real quick. I wanna make sure we understand this. Turn to Hebrews 12 real quick. Let's just go to the book, go to the right two books. Hebrews 12. It's the section in Hebrews 12 on, on the Lord's chastening. It says something very, very important about the whole process of chastening. Hebrews 12, verse 4. It says, You have not resisted to the point of shedding blood and your striving against sin. And you have forgotten the exhortation which is addressed to you as sons. My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord. Now watch this. Nor faint when you are reproved by him. For those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines. And he scourges every son whom he receives. That's a strong word, by the way. That does mean he whips. That's what it means. Same word that's used when Pilate scourged, had Jesus scourged. <clears throat> It is for discipline that you endure. God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? But if you are without discipline, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Furthermore, we had earthly fathers to discipline us and we respected them. Shall we not much rather be subject to the father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time, as seemed best to them, but he <clears throat> disciplines us for our good, it says. Then it says, all discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful, but sorrowful. Yet to those who have been trained by it afterwards, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness. Therefore, now look at verse 12, because that's important. Therefore... Strengthen the hands that are weak and the knees that are feeble and make straight paths for your feet so that the, the limb which is lame may not be turned or put out of joint but rather be healed. In other words, that's what God's after. If, if chastening only causes us to shrink back, well, then it's not gonna have. It's a fact. God doesn't want us to shrink back from it. And whatever lame thing, whatever defective joint God's trying to fix, it's, it's, he might have to break it first, set it, wrap it up so that it can be healed, but let him do that. If we run from the process, it, it, it won't be healed. What he's going after won't be dealt with. It won't be, it won't be fixed. You can turn on back to <clears throat> Timothy now. So you get the point there. Even in chastening, so rather than, than causing us to shrink back, and in Timothy's case, out of fear, the spirit actually does something different. God's not given us the spirit of timidity, verse seven says, but of power and love and discipline or a sound mind. So here, Paul identifies three ways that the Spirit manifests himself <clears throat> in the willing believer. The first is power. Power, in this instance, refers to the, to the aggressive energy in the face of difficulty, which overcomes the weakness of cowardice and enables one to work, to endure, to suffer, and to die if need be. Power. God gives us the ability to face whatever it is. Secondly is love. And this is that kind of self-forgetting love of Christ. 
<clears throat> excuse me, self-forgetting love to Christ and, and to his church and to the souls of men. This kind of love that exhorts and warns and rebukes with boldness and fidelity at whatever risk of consequences to self. It's a love that pushes us beyond our natural fears that we may have and says, no, go love them. Uh, go, here's a tough one, go witness to them, <laughs> right? Oh, no, Lord, don't let me talk to that person. <clears throat> and then the third one there is discipline. This is the only occurrence of this word in the New Testament. And the meaning is that of self-control, self-discipline. It also means the exercise of a sane, balanced mind. Fear can make you lose your balance. Fear can make you freak out over things that we shouldn't be freaking out over. So this idea of discipline here, King James says, sound mind. But it's more than just the mind. It's the whole the whole man. So the believer then, rather, giving, rather than giving way to fear, is to be animated, power, right? Motivated, they're to love, and then dictated by the Spirit, governed by the Spirit, disciplined, and all thoughts, words, and actions. So in this way, Paul believes that Timothy will be equal to any pressure upon him. Now look at verse eight. <clears throat> Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord or of me, his prisoner, but join with me in suffering for the gospel according to the power of God. So here we see the root cause of Paul's concern <clears throat> about Timothy's fear. Timothy may have had an inclination toward fear in his heart. We don't want to go too far in that assumption. We do know that Timothy frequently stood tall for the gospel. Remember Paul said of him in, in Philippians, I hope to in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you shortly. This is Philippians 2.19. <clears throat> so that I also may be encouraged when I learn of your condition for no one else of kindred spirit. I don't have anybody else who will be genuinely concerned for your welfare as Timothy, for they're all seeking their own interests, not those of Christ Jesus. But you know of his, Timothy's, proven worth, that he served with me in the furtherance of the gospel like a child serving his father. So <laughs> we, we know that about Timothy. But remember, Paul here is reminding him not to be ashamed of the gospel testimony or of Paul, his messenger, God's messenger. Romans 1.16, Paul says that he was not ashamed of the gospel because of what it was and where it came from. But the temptation to be ashamed of the Christian faith is always present due to personal weaknesses and circumstantial fact factors. Let's just face it. Sometimes personal weakness prevails. Sometimes circumstantial factors prevail. Jesus was aware of this danger when he warned against it. <clears throat> it's damaging and enduring results in, in Mark chapter 8. It says here, Timothy is not to be ashamed of the gospel or ashamed of me, his prisoner. Paul was in prison and had been deserted by many of his former supporters. Timothy might also be tempted to forsake Paul in the interest of saving his own reputation. But obviously Paul stood for the truth. And a genuine love of the truth will always extend to those who suffer for proclaiming it no matter what their outward appearance or circumstances may be. Paul was suffering not because he was a, a criminal suffering justly for his own crimes, but because he was a Christian being faithful to his heavenly Lord. That's all it was. Paul then says in verse eight, but join with me in suffering for the gospel. So here, Paul invites Timoth 
Timothy to share with him in the noble work of suffering for the gospel, the good news, which in his time and even our time is, is often despised or rejected or even ignored by the world. Now, Paul didn't mean here that Timothy was to join him in his cell, which he may, that could have happened, I suppose. But that in his own situation, he would carry his own quota of suffering for the advancement and transmission of the gospel. It was inevitable, Paul said, would say to him later on, those who live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Between the world's way of thinking and that promoted by the gospel, there is a radical antithesis which only God's own loving action in Christ Jesus can reverse and overcome. So unless that happens, anyone who's living godly and true to the Lord Jesus Christ in their service, eventually they're going to get it. David Guzik said this, he said, we often fail to understand that it wasn't easy to follow a crucified master. Today we have sanitized Jesus and disinfected the cross, making it all safe. But in the day Paul wrote this, it would seem strange indeed to follow a crucified man and call him savior. Think of Jesus' teaching. If you want to be great, be the servant of all. Be like a child. Be like a slave. Be like the younger, like the last instead of the first. This is a testimony some would be ashamed of. I don't want to be that. I don't want to be lower. I don't want to suffer. I don't want to carry a cross. I don't want to deal with that. I want people to like me. I want to make it to the top. I want to be the most popular. I don't want that. I mean, if we were watching Jesus be crucified, and it's not something like, sign me up, right? The last part Paul says there, let's not forget this, according to the power of God. Suffering for the gospel is endurable only by the power of God. Only divine power can sustain the servant of the Lord under this kind of load. We need to remember that. Now, as I wind this down right now, I just, I, I want to just say, kind of going back to where we began at verse 6, let me say that it is not uncommon for believers to let themselves slip into a lethargic attitude about remaining useful. It is true that a constant stirring needs to happen in order to avoid that. Can any of you remember a time when you felt more useful to God, more useful in the Lord's service? There are many things that, that can cause a person to not be as useful for the Lord one day as they were another day. And I want our text today <clears throat> to be a reminder for all of us. And part of it goes back to what, do I, what we talked about last week. There is an expectation laid upon Timothy because of his calling, yes. But it's also because that there were a number of people who had witnessed the Spirit's work of developing Timothy. And the same holds true for all of us. Think about the things that make us lose heart. Think about the things that make us lose steam. I don't know about you guys, but there are times when I lose steam too easily. I get discouraged very easily. The smallest thing can sort of tip me over. Now, I deal with it in my heart. I mean, I try to take it to the Lord. I try to go to God and, and confess it to the Lord and say, Lord, I, you know, and whatever pours out of my heart at that time. But in my spirit, I'm, I'm quickly shaken and it, it really does disturb me sometimes because I know that sometimes it's because I lack the, the kind of trust that I need to have for the Lord. But 
How many times do Christians become semi-useless because something presses in upon them and they fall out of good use? Perhaps they put themselves on the shelf. They just decide, oh, life's too much for me right now. And they become useless just because they've checked out. So what I want to do in closing today is I want to remind us of a few things. I'd like us first of all to turn to 1 Timothy chapter 4. And then I'm going to have you go to Romans 12. 1 Timothy 4 and Romans 12. Timothy's told here to stir up. <clears throat> we find something along similar lines in 1 Peter chapter 4. And why don't we begin? Uh, let's start at verse 7. 1 Peter 4, verse 7. Oh, did I say 1 Timothy? Yes. <laughs> Duh. Now see, that's going to discourage me later on. 1 Peter chapter 4. <laughs> Typo. That's when you need verbal whiteout. 1 Peter chapter 4. I've got it right here in front. I'm looking at it. Come on, guys. Hey, have you ever been listening to a sermon and they tell you to turn to the wrong verse and they never catch it? You ever have that happen? <laughs> Why are you laughing, Byron? <laughs> I know, I've, I've been there. <laughs> First Peter chapter 4. Look what it says here, verse 7. It says, The end of all things is near. Therefore, be of sound judgment and sober spirit for the purpose of prayer. Above all, keep fervent in your love for one another because... Love covers a multitude of sins. Now watch this. Be hospitable to one another without complaint as each one has received a special gift. Employ it in serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Here's some examples. Whoever speaks is to do so as one who is speaking the utterances of God. Whoever serves is to do this as one who is serving by the strength which God supplies so that in all things God may be glorified through Christ Jesus to whom belongs the glory and dominion forever and ever. So it's saying here, if you have these abilities, then do it. Do it. Romans 12, turn there, that time I'm, it's Romans 12. There isn't a first or second Timothy 12, so you'll figure that one out pretty quick. Romans 12. I'm not going to go to verses 1 and 2. Those are the most popular ones to go to. We're not going there. There's, this is, is a chapter that has some parallels to 1 Corinthians 12. I mentioned some some of the gifts of the Spirit. Look at verse 6. It says, Since we have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, each of us is to exercise them accordingly. If prophecy, according to the proportion of his faith, if service in his serving, or he who teaches in his teaching, or he who exhorts in his exhortation, he who gives with liberality, he who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. That's just examples of different gifts and how it should be, <clears throat> how they should be uh, served in. But he says in verse six, each of us is to exercise them accordingly. It's something that's to be done. Timothy was being warned about allowing whatever 
gift Paul was referring to with Timothy about allowing that to be squelched because of fear. And he was telling Timothy, stir it up. I will simply leave you with this. Whatever has prevented you from being useful in God's service, you need to stir it up. Stir it up. Set that thing aside, whatever it is. Whatever is hindering you, it could be fear, unbelief, whatever it is. You need to set that aside. Because God has blessed us, Ephesians 4, with all spiritual blessings, Jesus Christ conquered to give gifts to his church so that the church can be strengthened through those gifts and we need to make sure that we don't allow something like fear to hold us back. Right now, <clears throat> we've prayed for the folks in the Middle East. I can't imagine what they're going through and just trying to get the word out. And the amount of opposition that they're facing in just trying to share the gospel with people and to get people saved and to disciple the people who get saved. They literally can lose their lives just, just talking about it. Now, we don't need to be shamed because we're not being persecuted in that way yet. It's coming. It's coming eventually. But where we do need to feel that sense of remorse is when we know that something much less significant can shut us down and render us useless in our service to God. And so, brothers and sisters, we need to make sure that we too, as the apostle was writing here to Timothy, we need to make sure that we stir up the gift of God that is within us through the laying on of hands, for God has not given us a spirit of timidity. God's not called us to shrink back, to cower. God's not called us to, be, to succumb to that kind of fear. The Lord's saying, shake it off and move into the light and do whatever he wants us to do. Amen? Amen. Let's stand. It doesn't end there. There's actually more reason for this. It's, it's gonna continue. Paul's gonna remind Timothy about a lot of things related to verses six through eight. And I, I can picture why Paul is saying this, why he's writing this. Obviously, the Spirit is inspiring him to do it. That's the number one reason. <clears throat> but, you know, the situational circumstance that exists, Paul is looking at his young protege. He, Paul knows he's about to be taken out. I mean, he's about to be removed from the picture. There is that concern. I, I would feel the same way if I, was, if I knew I was dying Hopefully, the state of mind I'll be in at that time is, is I'll be thinking about how you guys are going to continue on in the faith, how my children and family are going to continue on in the faith, and not shrink back for whatever reason, whether it's worldliness or just fear, unbelief, whatever the case may be. Amen? Father in heaven, we just want to pray for our hearts. We want to pray, Lord God, that you would please stir us up, God. We sing that song, stir up a hunger for more of you. And Lord, we pray that you would please deliver us from our fears, from those things, Lord, that paralyze us and keep us, Lord, from having strong faith in you. Lord, we're reminded of Caleb and Joshua. Just a difference in their attitude compared to the other 10 spies. Lord, we don't want to follow in, in the footsteps of those 10 spies. We want to know that when our God is moving forward that we're, we're wanting to move forward with him. So Lord, that's what we want in our hearts. 
Father in heaven, just thank you so much for every individual that you've drawn here today. Lord, no one is here by accident. And I just want to pray, Lord, that you would please let this, please, Lord, let us hear what the Spirit is saying to us today. And let us not harden our hearts, God. Let us be open, Lord, to you and to your prodding. And we just thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.